you, you, you cut my straight. So you were... Hold it! Shut up! You cut my straight. I'm picking up the straight that he's cut, right? Now, the straight that I'm weaving as I'm talking is what I can say now. This, this new idea of describing whatever you read, you don't have to call it that, becomes being at the point where I can say the next word. It's like walking. I need to be here to put my foot there. I need to be here to put my foot there. So there is a dimensionality that comes into description which was excluded, and that is why the old systems had the type theory, which is the dimensionality of temporality. The dimension of time is the straight which you interrupted, right? And it's useful, this interruption, because I can use it. Is that when I'm weaving this thread, when I'm, when I'm following this thread, it becomes possible at any moment con in that continuity to say the next thing. And it is only a question of how I get there. It is not a question of what things are. It is a question of how I learn. It is a question of when I can say something. And as we become confident with that, I, I've explored it in all sorts of different media and dimensions. As we become confident of that, we, we stop being these outside observers, we, we stop being these controllers, and we start swimming in something which floats, and uh, flows, <coughs> not floats, flows, flows. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, I don't know if the, I, I hate these kind of odd words, but there is a sense in which I can trust that if you cut my thread, even that can become the thread that I can then pick up again and makes it possible to say the same. So these conferences and uh, meetings like this, each time regurgitate stuff, and next time, the next conference it will be possible to say different things. The sentences in which autopoiesis was originally formulated were very contorted. And slowly over time, they became easier and easier to say. And slowly over time, yeah, so, so the, the, the sense in which the language or the culture or our private language, our cybernetic language develops is the way in which our way of grasping things develops, is, is the way cybernetics develops. There is no distinction. That's, I'll leave it there. That's good. I would like to show something. Because the image of the camera should be wired into the monitor. And I'm pointing the camera at its own image. There was a topic of infinity being addressed earlier on. Yes. From Heinz in a particular way. And Heinz's trick about the three things is actually adding a dimension. Yes. Your thing is adding a dimension. Yes. Now, I'm interested in the video camera as a cybernetic tool. Yes. yes. Because it adds a dimension which I want. Oh. Yes. <laughs> now, if you look at this, you have a screen. You can see what I'm pointing at. Yeah. Right. You have a framework of reference in which <laughs> objects are being depicted or people are being depicted. I'm now trying to move into the screen. You, you now have the infinite regress of the object framing itself. Yeah? If I can get it, at some point it shifts. So I'm, I'm now exploring this space. Ah, you're getting excited. <laughs> there you go. Turn it, turn it, turn it. But you don't have to smoke anything. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have enough money to buy a TV and a camera. Okay, now see, see, it suddenly becomes an operation. wants to play with trying to make it happen. What, do you want what I'm interested in is the switch from I'd be glad to play with is the switch from the objects, right? This is we, this is the world we are so far used to operating in. This is talking about. Yeah. As soon as you do this, everybody knows what we're talking about. As soon as you can refer to diagrams on the wall. Okay? Now as soon as you go to the temporal thing, first we don't even we don't yet know how to make sense of it. Because all our conventions for talking haven't got that one yet. Herbert, except only make sense of it. But yes. we cannot find what sense it has before we make some. 
Yes, thank you. Don't thank you. Pleasure was mine. What I wow. like is, you see? Wow. Here. Wow. Yes. So I'm moving into, I'm moving into, away from objects. The whole infinite regression, <laughs> which all this paradox and stuff always puts there as the horrible thing. And the first person pronoun, I am, there. There you go. Yeah. remains, there you go, that's lovely, that's it, that's it. <laughs> rhythm, rhythm. The I am. The infinite regress is only the edge of shifting from objects to rhythms, from where to when. The infinite regress is, about, is, is just, it's just a hiccup on the way there. And it's been 2,000 years and it's stopped us going there. Except for musicians, I guess. I is convinced. Hmm? Yeah. I is convinced. I is convinced. I see he's interested in playing with the regress. Well, he's a man. He's a man. Seriously, we develop eventually in life what we might then call when asked our main interest or main interests. Uh, they are also somewhere among the criteria when decisions have to be made. And there, there are some of these have the loudest voice and some of them have the largest agreement among themselves. So there may be one main interest which screams and then there are second main interests that join together and make little choirs. Uh, my recommendation is use the main interest nested within the secondary interests. The secondary interest should be the nest in which you want to lay your real egg. And it must be large enough so that the egg doesn't break if you put it in the wrong place. I claim that, uh, I call it, find a secondary interest large enough to host and nest your main interest so that the host can protect the guest from the guest's mistakes and errors. If I consider myself mainly a composer, I made changing society my secondary interest, and I am composer within the condition that I change society, or want to at least, or I'm busy with it. This cannot be damaged even if I write a bad piece. And I want to be able to write bad pieces because I'm not willing to make mistakes. I stop experimenting. If I stop experimenting, I can go home. Weaving, looking, eyes looking. Weaving, making, designing. Provocation, perturbations. Provocative perturbations.
I like the notion of explanatory principles. And I think what we are doing here again and again and again, pulling explanatory principles out. Why do we enjoy that? Why we do that? We like it. That a meeting like this, where the committees of criteria are so drastically intermingled and confronted, is so pleasant. It's a reason to have it again. It's, uh, I mean it. It's wonderful. Committee of Criteria meets spontaneously when I need help in making a decision, a choice, a change. Or in another language, I sit in a room like this with a table like this with a little lamp, it's dark. And I write and I get stuck. That's another word for needing a decision, a change, I mean, I'm stuck, short. Suddenly, doors open all around me, and the criteria look in, and they start jabbering at me. Take me, you liked me the last time, da, da, da. Do this, why don't you do this? Then they start screaming at one another. Imagine a theater place, play where the actors are prompted by more than one prompter, <laughs> and that the prompters are not in agreement with the script. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> it turns out that you can't always get away with the idea of the beginning and the end. I may have a conversation, say, about Hammer, which may be said to begin and to end, even though it is often interrupted by telephone calls, by visitors, or whatever. There are certain situations, however, which are essentially evolutionary and continuingly evolutionary. I propose one of many mechanisms whereby this not only may but must come about. It turns out that we cannot order with beginnings and ends. You see, Chicho's point about medium existing or coming into existence with the organism in medium and the sense being inseparable from it or, if you like, making its own separation from it, if you accept this, and I know you really do, Stafford, uh, it's the case that you have to revamp your notions of temporality. In fact, you also have to revamp, so far as I can see, and here I'm open to correction, our notions of fundamental science. Provocative If I use the notion of topoiesis properly to understand that living systems are autopoietic systems and as such are structural determined entities for which all this applies, then the answer is yes, because we will be continuously following into the biology of love. That's the motivation. Yeah. Why do people not know that? Because we are a culture of principles. But it's, love is not a principle. If there is the biology of love operating, certain things happen which otherwise would not happen. The biology of love, the domains of relations and dynamics are such that those involved experience legitimization. When embracing cybernetic concepts, how might one's thinking about consciousness, conversation, composing social transformations, orient one's acting? Well, uh, it comes in nicely here, actually. I was reading an introduction to a book of Gertrude Stein essays in which there was a little comment about the work of William James, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a quotation about consciousness is continuous. And there is a, a, a small paragraph about the turn of the century when everybody was interested in consciousness. And in comes Freud, 
and everybody suddenly becomes interested in subconsciousness. Why? Because we can translate. We're in a universe in which the subconscious is something that we can discover, interpret, translate. But the, the continuous, the going on of the conscious, is not translatable. And therefore, all the scientific descriptive mechanism does not work for it. Scientists play as if they were only scientists when they are not. <laughs> so my only possibility, using verbal expression, is to anti-communicate is to use my words in such a way that I force them to mean what I want. And to force them to mean what I want, I have to create a whole condition in which they mean what I want. Curiously enough, I want them to mean what they mean in daily life. <laughs> and the problem with scientists is that they consider them separated from daily life. And this is, yes, these scientists consider themselves separated from daily life. They claim that they are not emotional, but emotions do not participate in what they do, and so on and so forth, and it's not true. It is a suicidal society in the language. It uses it, that uses it. Go back to consciousness. Consciousness is knowing with. Knowing with. Know with of something. And that something is not only by hypothesis, but by assertion. Uh, mostly ourselves. In other words, we don't gain uniformity, we gain unity, which is coherence and difference mm -hmm. by conversation. But in order to call it action, you have to anchor it to some agreed domain. When we agree that peace is a need, circularity of needs, Asynchronicity becomes a necessity for meeting our need for peace. I can't go back to consciousness. <laughs> it, it, no, what you've got to say on it is so lovely that I don't want it continuously. Right. Yeah. It's consciousness. Yes. Yeah, go on. Consciousness is conscientia. Knowing with. Knowing with. Know with of something. And that something is not only by hypothesis but by assertion, uh, mostly ourselves. The predicament of self-reference is that I am continuously reflecting on what I'm doing, whether I make it explicit or not. All these levels, allegedly regressive levels, are not regressive because where I actually am is where I actually am. I am in the present. I was in the future. I shall be in the past. I claim that we living existence exist in the present. In fact, the whole existence is in the present. Now, we have this ability because we exist in language of operating in such a way that we can talk about our being now and make explanations about how are we in the present, and this is history, or computations about what could be transformations from this present, and we call this the future. Your present changes, your past changes. Your present changes, your future changes. We today behave as if we could not understand this future, although it is the only thing we should understand. The past is past, the present happens anyway, and understanding and agreement has to be given to false statements. This is part of designing a society, is to answer questions after having made a statement that isn't true yet, but you wish it to be true. So that people don't know yet what to write in the desire assignment, they should simply sit down and think a moment what they want changed. That has to be understood, otherwise we are running totally blind. Every eye not only needs peace, but wants peace. So asynchronicity is an invitation for generating newness through conversations that turns objects into rhythms.
provocative conversations. Provocative conversations. The other day, when I was talking against reference, there was a comment about we exist in language, which came from the room. That's difficult for me because existence is a word. Existence is uh, something which I find presuppositionally in, in, in our speaking, I have to presuppose the existence of anything I talk about. And that immediately turns me into this, uh, turns the language into this realistic epistemology. So as soon as I talk about language, language is assumed to exist, is assumed to be a thing that is there. And the kind of models, if I make a connection here, the kind of models that Lou is talking about are slowly, I think over the last 20 years in cybernetics, more and more we have been able to make models in which we can do this continuous thing. All this is results of reading papers on cybernetics, recursion, circularity, self-reference between Heinz von Förster, Bateson, Maturan, Parsk, Ashby. And if you are on, in tune, you will notice behind it the whisperings of all these papers. Here it is again. If the two marks concatenated are allowed to collapse each other to nothing, if that is allowed to happen, then on the one hand, you have the sequence which is building the, the recursive image inside of image. But if, if it's allowed to <coughs> cancel, uh, then it will just go down to oscillation. Square wave. So, square wave. Yeah. Yeah. Sawdust. Yeah. Sawdust. Yeah. Tell us about sawdust. Square wave. There's another way of describing it. Go on. Louder? You have here the, have the resolution obtained as an oscillation. The oscillator solution, IJTF, IJTF, etc. Yesterday, when you were not yet here, Ernst von Glassesfeld was saying that this was a metaphor. And Lou said, this is a rope. Now, I will then say... Later I admitted it was a metaphor. Sorry? But I don't know if he admitted you, it was you a said rope. It was, yeah. You said it's a rope. Yes, and okay. later I admitted it was a metaphor, but I don't know if he admitted that it was a rope. <laughs> but this is a, this is a line on a blackboard made with chalk. I'm chalk. Aware of that. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I know my sight is getting dim, darling. But I... No, no, no. That is something that's happening. <laughs> Of a monocule, it it's not an oscillation you're pointing at. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a drawing. It's a drawing of an oscillation <laughs> made in chalk upon an apparatus called a blackboard, just as that is a, yes. a drawing made in TV. No, that's not a drawing. That is My a feat. That is it. That's that's the actual thing. It's not a representation of the thing. It is the thing. You can treat it as a, as a metaphor for self-reference. Yeah, yeah. But what's going on there is going on there. And yeah. Yeah, you're actually getting... Well, anything, yeah. that, anything, anything presumed... And that difference is exactly what I mean about living in the eye of language, that if, if we're continuously referentially throwing it out, we never get in. There is always the idea of radical change. So radical change takes place in the mind. Can I draw you back to what, uh, the beginning? You were, you were talking about this operation of, or geometrically thinking of, uh, looking at thought as always having a, 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 an orthogonal component. Yeah. Orthogonal um, to what? Component to well, what? For, well, for example, <laughs> if, if, to the mind. 
the mind is consisting in a process which produces the boundary. And the boundary is in the And that goes on indefinitely. And in fact, it, it will eat its own tail. And if it eats its own tail, it may be regarded in a coherent sense as true. It existing. If it doesn't, it doesn't exist. I mean, it's back to this vegetation. I would, say, I would say mind is a first-person pronoun. You would have... Why don't mind what is there? We cannot be outside mind. So you, you, to say mind is, is not... Well, I never suggested we were outside it. Yes, the, the language in which you say mind is project, yeah. pro propels you outside it. I don't see why it does. I mean... Uh, I, I am in mind, I have a mind, you have a mind, we all have minds. There is a social mind, there is a mind consisting of the people in this room, <coughs> and so on. There are many minds, the entire conference. Uh, we make mind, we mind, we remind, we remind ourselves. We make boundaries. Yes, we make boundaries, which is how, how we make mind in that sense, because the process which makes a boundary, which is a distinction, if you like. Right. Right. And that's the business of right. I was haggling on the, the necessity of inserting. Such a process necessitates a mind to comprehend the boundary. Yeah, that's right. And what would such a process be? be? A process that makes a boundary necessitates a mind yeah. to comprehend the boundary. <laughs> That's right. But different minds are going to construct different boundaries. So it seems. And right. therefore right. different entities. Yes, it is. And your idea of a dog is not my idea of a dog. The only caveat I introduce is not how they conceive the dog. I mean, for example, what you call a dog might be a clinical to me. But there is no way in which it's going to stable. You won't have a stable quadruped or a stable unicorn, uh, nor will I. Would you say that the dog for me is the same as the image produced is for the circuit television camera? Too easy. But there is an analogy. Well, there's an analogy, yes. What is that? There is an analogy which is designated by that as a metaphor. Well, the camera doesn't have any choice. Sir? The television circuit has no other choice but to cognize feeding back it on does. itself. That's right. right. And yes. you have choice. Choice. The choice is a condition for the generation of significance. Anything that was not choice between alternatives, nothing has any meaning, no matter what anybody says. Of course, in our social world, things is what's said about them, but a lot of what's said about them is slander and libel. So beware. If you cannot detect in a statement or report what it says no to, then you haven't got the meaning. Then you are in the presence of dicta dictatorship or what you so very contemptuously call manipulation, although I must say manipulation is one of the most wonderful feelings one can have. B, choice manifests your freedom as the number of alternatives you have for choice. Freedom is nothing else but the number of alternatives. And you can detect that immediately when you, for instance, have a plan to change something, the first thing that happens to you your alternatives diminish immediately. Because you have to, in order to state your point, avoid lots of other points you have been used to. Uh, if you want to fight for the blacks, or for the whites, or for the greens, or for the women, or whatever, the first thing you do, you constrain, not that, not that, not that, not that, and finally you are sitting there with three alternatives and become a big bore. However, that does not accuse the aim or goal it only makes you very lousy strategists. So the joke is, and the pleasure is, 
Number C, if I distinguish between the best alternative, where I have to put all others down in order to call it the best, or if I want to rather make the best choice, where I keep them all up so that I can use them tomorrow, and that I call the one I choose only the nowest and not the best choice. So I distinguish between the best alternative and the best choice. I recommend the best choice if they two are not identical. Frequently they are identical. More often they are appear identical. Most often they are lied about and claimed to be identical. Don't believe it. Investigate. Doesn't have any choice. The television circuit has no other choice but to cognize feeding the way back it on does. itself. Right. right. Unfortunately, you have to hold the camera. That's true. But once we're holding the camera, you uh, you can explore that place. Very yeah. interesting things. In fact, a very large number of interesting things. It's like some rotating mirror maze tricks. Well, you first you have to get the idea of holding the camera like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but the, the interesting thing to me on that but is that see, no when we think of self-reference, we think it's yeah. one thing. But it, there's, there's a whole... If you, once you start doing it, once you start playing with it, there's a whole lot of things in there. There's a whole lot... The, the, it's, to me, it's like a space which has boundaries of which these <coughs> infinite regresses happen, and, and in between something else happens. But that's a boundary in itself. Possible. I mean, that's a boundary which the bounds a particular kind of world. world. My perception of yeah. it is such, yeah. No wonder! So many people found cybernetics and systems theory unintelligible. We are a society that is, to put simply, counter-cybernetic. Storm coming in, dusk, full moon. Went in the ghetto today and hung out with Sabrina. This kid I've been seeing for about three years, who has been severely traumatized and largely as a result of living in the ghetto. Mother's a heavy duty drug abuser, alcoholic. Father's a drug dealer in jail, dying of alcoholism, dying of liver cancer at the age of 39 or 8 or something like that. Sabrina's a brilliant kid who has incredible potential but has parts that have developed in order to survive that are very destructive and very negative. So I took her and her aunt, Nina, out today and we had breakfast and hung out. And, you know, it just gets me so much in touch with questioning what I do as not being an effective intervention. Um, because it's like this environment that is so inconducive to anybody being healthy. It's phenomenal. I mean, there's, there's people drinking at 10 o'clock in the morning and drugging and screaming and little kids that are 6, 7, and 8 and that are practically destroyed already, but wonderful souls, you know? I mean, it's just really overwhelming to me. I hate it. I absolutely hate this whole scene. And it really, you know, makes me feel the need for creating a new culture, a new society. Imagine any society in which there is no crime. You cannot, we try to, we say the words, I can't imagine. But if I ask, tell me, nothing comes out. So what are you going to propose such that the human beings are not negative? Provocative conversations. To be aware that we are dealing with human beings. That is, we're dealing with beings that exist in language and reflect and so on and so forth. So none of our models or our notions about systems which are composed of elements which are not human beings applies. Any modeling of a human community in terms of an organism, for example, fails fundamentally. Because the components of the organism, cells or organs, do not operate in language, do not operate in self-reflection, cannot suddenly stand and say, I do not agree with being part of this organism. They cannot do so. But human beings can do so. So any political design is facing this question. Am I going to respect or not 
that the elements with which I'm involved are human beings. Now, the notion of autopoiesis, in this sense, has one difficulty, and it is that to the extent that you constitute an autopoietic system, but you constitute a system in whose dynamics everything is subordinated to the conservation of the autopoiesis. So the components are entirely subordinated. If these were human beings, they would be subordinated. If they are cells, they are subordinated to this. You think your cells remain the same from minute to minute? You think the single molecule that isn't changed that micro giga nanosecond or something? <laughs> well, if you do, I think you're a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I suggest you take Prozac or something. <laughs> Performance. Sharing your presence. Sharing your presence. Not the content, not the form, not the no opinion. Just, I'm here. Sometimes it's done by looking at somebody. It is uh, the colloquial, vulgar version of consensual domain. Conveying your thought and your intention. That need not necessarily be the consensual domain. It probably cannot do without it. But it is the first one really is. The second is already making use of it. Conveying your thought and your attention. Carrying your messages so that they reach out the way you want. Which is different from being a successful writer that uh, it should be fulfilled already at the time you write the thing. The other fulfillments are of a different kind. I don't deny their need, but it's not what I mean. The feeling of reach out the way you want should be felt by you on the day I've written it. Provocative conversations. In a conversation, say about that video camera or the other one which I see backing it up, uh, I don't know you guys, or is there another one waiting around? <laughs> <laughs> what happens is that we learn more about each other, you and I, and I of you. We learn how we not only agree about the nature of a couple of somewhatly different oriented video cameras, we also learn how we disagree. And in so doing, we learn about each other. And we do that a darn sight more than we learn about video cameras. Mind you, I'm not saying you don't learn about video cameras. But I am saying we learn much more about ourselves and our resort to something like Stafford's Fibonacci series argument in order to show that this is true on the social scale as well as the scale of a conversation between a couple of participants called A and B. And there was a song we used to sing in the army. It's the sign the old world over. It's the poor what gets the blame. It's the rich, what gets the pleasure? Ain't it all a bleeding shine? And here we are in Britain with the gap between the rich and the poor steadily widening all the time as to income, as to actual wealth. Same thing is happening in the United States. And everybody says, oh, now, why on earth should this be? It is because we have structured a system not understanding the principle of requisite variety, not understanding this feedback phenomenon, which is dedicated to producing this effect. Why have we designed this stupid system to do the wrong thing? A year ago, I would have said, what is why? Today, I would like to do something around when is violence. This is an a very, very fundamental shift from what is violence to when is violence. Because when is violence, we are there. 
But God is violence, we are not there, we are here. When is not violence? When is not violence? This is the question. Why? When violence is heard as a message. And when acts according to the message that one hears. The problem with violence is, even if we uh, listen to the message and then not punish the perpetrator, but rather the situation which is undesirable. If we can do that, then we at least after the act of violence uh, interrupt the circularity of it. The little mm -hmm. breaks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. We will not undo what happened. That's right. But when we start the point of something, that's what I call cutting the. Yeah. Is this big? Okay, I'll stop then. What? I'll stop oh, it. It's going back to the special. Do so you have a presentation in there? That was your presentation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that your yeah. presentation? Yeah, when the presentation becomes a discussion, I stop. Mm -hmm. You want me to carry on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Discussion of science. <laughs> yeah, discussion of science. Although I tend to agree with Chicho about formalization, I took care that a whole lot of research effort would not be wasted by making sure that my participants in a conversation or in a more general phenomenon which might involve corporations, might involve societies, nations, politicians, whatever, could be identified with participants, every one of them. If they had these simple properties, organizational closure, informational openness, evolution in a mystery, a mystery. That is, I don't know what time is, <laughs> nor do you, and I don't believe in it anyhow. It's a very simplistic view of the world. Now, that's my first point. Now, how long do I have to be? Another 15 minutes. Very good. Could you give me a five minute cue? I will. Thank you. Uh, now, I don't believe in time. <laughs> seriously be cyberneticians and should know something about cybernetics and should not just yak about it and pretend and verbalize and vapor about it. And we ought to know about Ashby's work and we ought to know about Chicho's work and we ought to know Heinz's work in particular. In particular because first of all I think it's excellent and next because for heaven's sake, sir, uh, this meeting is in some respect a celebration. In fact, did celebrate. <laughs> so I was writing a thesis about language, which I, which I was scientifically speaking not allowed to write. Mm -hmm. I was organizing meetings on self-reference and was having a lot of fun with them. And what did I do? I decided if self-reference, if language, then the, the one place in which we can actually find out what this kind of new description that would deal with this would do is in trying to describe language. So instead of adopting the notion of description that had already, I mean the whole century has been about questioning that idea of description, I was trying to say in language we, we have to find a new way of describing whatever that means. I mean, it, doesn't, it may no longer be describing. It may not actually, it may actually be a different medium that is necessary, which is where my work has gone since uh, 81. And what happens is that the language is the map in which... Yeah. Minetta, excuse me, I did not follow what you meant or, or what, what the explanation was. 
when you said that you were not allowed, you were prohibited in some way from the investigation or discussing it. The what? type theory, type theory that we, it was, it's nice because Lou just had it up here, right? Type theory would not allow the description of language in formal, in language. In formal terms. So if you happen to have a, an examiner who happens to be a mathematical logician, he says, sorry, you can't describe natural language. He says, to him, it is a mathematical result that natural language is undescribable. So you are yes? speaking to an orthodoxy from outside the orthodoxy and excluding yourself. I was a student of this man, who is not an orthodoxy. I was simultaneously a student in a linguistics <laughs> department, and I had organized some meetings on self-reference, of which some of the members were trying to examine my thesis. One of them was an orthodoxy, may or may not be. It was, anyway. Is that an answer? That's an answer, go on. You were in a predicament then. Uh, let's not, let's not, let's not <laughs> hurry about that. Okay. Can you just accept, yes. she needs to have uh, people not ask questions yet. Yeah, because we're, 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 we're not yet to the thesis of the two oh, okay. You, you, you cut my straight. So you were... Hold it! Shut up! You cut my straight. I'm picking up the straight that he's cut, right? Now, the straight that I'm weaving as I'm talking is what I can say now. This, this new idea of describing whatever you read, you don't have to call it that, becomes being at the point where I can say the next word. It's like walking. I need to be here to put my foot there. I need to be here to put my foot there. So there is a dimensionality that comes into description which was excluded and that is why the old systems had uh, the type theory, which is the dimensionality of temporality. The dimension of time is the, the thread which you interrupted, right? And it's useful this interruption because I can is that when I'm weaving this thread, when I'm, when I'm following this thread, it becomes possible at any moment con in that continuity to say the next thing. And it is only a question of how I get there. It is not a question of what things are. It is a question of how I learn. It is a question of when I can say something. And as we become confident with that, I, I've explored it in all sorts of different media and dimensions, as we become confident of that, we, we stop being these outside observers, we, we stop being these controllers, and we start swimming in something which floats, and uh, flows, <laughs> not floats, flows, flows, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, I don't know if the, I, I hate these kind of odd words, but there is a sense in which I can trust that if you cut my thread, even that can become the thread that I can then pick up again and makes it possible to say the thing. So these conferences and uh, meetings like this each time regurgitate stuff and next time, the next conference it will be possible to say different things. The sentences in which autopoiesis was originally formulated were very contorted and slowly over time they became easier and easier to say and slowly over time, yeah, so, so the, the, the sense in which the language or the culture or our private language, our cybernetic language develops is the way in which our way of grasping things develops, is, is the way cybernetics develops. There is no distinction. I'll leave it there.